Uh, we would like to welcome you to this afternoon's breakout session on sex trafficking. Our guest speakers this afternoon are Kathy McCalla and Roxanne Ryan. Kathy McCalla works presently with the Juvi Juvenile Justice Fund, serving as the CSEC, or Commercial Sexual Exploitation of Children Program Manager. In this position, Kathy oversees a future, not a past, a multi-million a multi-year campaign to stop a <laughs> multi-million. <laughs> okay, right. a, uh, it's, it, we've just had lunch. A multi-year campaign to stop the prostitution of children in Georgia, and the CEASE program, a prevention early intervention for commercially exploited children in the sex industry. I'd also like to introduce Roxanne Ryan. Roxanne Ryan is a senior criminal investigator, a senior criminal intelligence analyst with the Iowa Division of Intelligence and Fusion Center with the Iowa Department of Public Safety. She spent 24 years in the Iowa Attorney General's Office in the criminal divisions and taught criminal justice full time at Simpson College for two years. She also teaches as an adjunct professor at Drake Law School. She is a graduate of ISU, the University of Iowa College of Law, and the University of Nebraska, where she earned her PhD in criminal justice. Um, please welcome our guest speakers today, and thank you very much for your participation. I will invite you to ask questions. We would like this to be um, this session will involve their giving their presentations, and then we would like to make it as audience engaged as possible. So please do take note, write down questions. We will do our very best to answer your questions. Hi, I will try to be engaging so that none of you will fall asleep after having just such a nice full stomach. Before we had to have the lights off to do it, and I thought we were going to be dead meat, but um, <laughs> we were able to get our projector working well. And I want to thank Teresa. Uh, we've had a number of uh, email conversations back and forth, and just thank you for all that you've done. Um, I think on this particular issue, it doesn't matter whether you live in Iowa or whether you live in Georgia or you live in Maine or wherever you live. It's something that all of us need to be concerned about. Um, Georgia has had the, I don't know whether it's misfortune or fortune, to have identified this issue fairly early. So we have been doing uh, quite a bit since about the year 1999, when one of our juvenile court judges really started asking questions of the girls that were appearing in front of her bench and realized that there was what she called a hidden epidemic that was going on. So we really, the Juvenile Justice Fund was really founded around this particular issue and around the victims that were really going unseen and unheard in almost every single system uh, that existed in Georgia. So I realize Georgia is not Iowa. I don't know what your situation is here. I don't ever want it to be like somebody coming in telling you this is the way we did it and that's the way you need to do it too. I, I will tell you what we've done and then from our experience uh, what we found and then whatever you feel works within your own systems may be something that you'll want to take a look at. What I can tell you is that this is an issue that no one organization is going to solve. It requires uh, tremendous collaborations uh, uh, among all the private sector, uh, non-governmental agencies, and all the public sector agencies. And so it, it is something that I think, um, at some very spiritual level, I think it may be giving us the opportunity to work together um, which we don't seem to be doing a very good job on just about everything else in this country. And so maybe we can learn over this issue that we can all work together no matter what our political differences or our religious differences or our ethnic or racial differences because it's so wrong, no one stands really against what you're trying to do except that those that are profiting illegal by it and those are the ones we want to take down anyway. So. Um, I'll tell you just uh, a little bit about the campaign, uh, and it started really in the year 2007, but we had been using um, these things and working with issues since the year 2000 when Angela's House was founded, which was really the first safe house in the southeast. Um, and we had been working with girls that were coming through the juvenile court, mind the way, I'm going to have to kind of do this so that everybody can see. Um, 
But then a funder that had been funding Angela's house basically said, you know, I want to make, I want to put Angela's house out of business. At which point, those of us that were working at Angela's house and for Angela's house just about fell on the floor. But what he meant is we should, as a community, not stand for the fact that we have to have safe houses for these victims. They shouldn't exist. And so he said, instead of just serving the victims, he said, all we've been doing for the last seven to eight years was standing down at the end of the stream and pulling the victims out. And he said, if, we, if that's all we do, then that's all we're always going to have to do. He said, we have to start moving upstream and start to look at what's driving this business. So really, from the beginning, A Future Not a Past has been niched on the demand side of this issue. So I will be giving kind of an overview of both this, uh, and I'll talk about it in a way that almost seems, I always feel like I have to give a disclaimer, because it is a business. That's why it's profiting so much for the people that are engaged in it. So there is a supply side, and unfortunately, our children are the supply side. So as awful as it sounds to talk about kids as being supply, that's what they are in this business. And then there's a demand side. So, and I have that framework in my head so that everything I think about, I think, okay, is that a supply side intervention or is that a demand side intervention? And if you're going to bring down a business, you've got to either decrease the supply or got to decrease the demand or hopefully you're going to do both. And so one without the other probably won't work. Um, whoops, wrong way. So to start out with, um, just a little bit about terminology, because I don't think we've even really landed on what we're calling these victims. Um, we really avoid using the word prostitute because of all the connotations of that word in terms of morality and choice and all the rest of it. If you have to use it, what we'll do is say it's a prostituted child, so that it's as if somebody is doing that to them. But we really, um, when you're first getting awareness raised, that word, uh, commercial sexual exploitation of children doesn't flow off the tip of your tongue unless you've said it as many times as I had. And then you get through that and somebody says, what's that? And then you say, it's the prostitution of children. And then it's, oh, okay. The child sex trafficking is something that is getting more and more to be used. Um, I still prefer commercial sexual exploitation of children because it then includes also pornography, which child sex trafficking doesn't seem to do as much. But child sex trafficking, I think people are really, really beginning to understand what that means. Uh, domestic minor sex trafficking, you'll hear. I was going to be showing a video that I, something's wrong with my DVD, and I didn't bring a backup. So shared hope uh, video, and they were referring it to it at domestic minor sex trafficking, so I wanted to make sure I mentioned that and then the human trafficking, which you've been hearing a lot of um, today. And just by way of comparison, I, I think of human trafficking, it's the umbrella. It's the larger issue. It includes adults as well as kids. It, in, it includes, I think for the most part, people have the misconception that it's only international in scope. And I think that allows us as um, Americans to think that that's, that's an awful problem, but it's occurring over there. And that somehow because it's occurring over there, we don't have to be as concerned about it. So I think it's important to realize that trafficking occurs domestically as, as well as internationally. And in fact, there are more domestically trafficked minors than there are internationally trafficked minors um, in this country. But, and it also, the human trafficking um, includes sex as well as labor. So what, we're, what I'll be talking about and the work that we do exclusively is on sexual exploitation of minors that are United States citizens. It's domestic, they are underage, and for the most part, to begin with, we have focused on girls. That's not to say it doesn't happen to boys, it does. For all we could tell at the beginning, there were more girls than boys. Boys tend to be um, trafficked for homosexual sex instead of heterosexual sex, so there's enough difference in the way they present that it's hard to be doing them both at the same time, but we are just now at the point in Georgia where we're beginning to look at doing the research on are the, are the red flags the same for the boys? Uh, do they have a pimp the same way as the uh, girls tend to? What exactly does it look like? And then how do we get services for the boys also? So, um, and it does include, it in also includes the uh, uh, LGBT 
youth also, uh, lesbian, gay, and transgendered youth, because they also are a very, at, they're vulnerable for all the same reasons and then some. So it's not just girls, even though most of our work to this point has been mostly on, on girls. Um, the way we define it is this, that the CSEC is sexual abuse at the very beginning that's accompanied by remuneration in cash or in kind. And that in kind is very important because if somebody trades, if a, if a youth runs away and trades sex for food or shelter, they are a trafficking victim. They have exchanged something of value. Somebody that really felt sorry for them and wanted to help them could have given them shelter or could have given them a meal without exacting sex as a payment for providing that. So it's important to realize that um, the survival sex, which sometimes the homeless or runaway youth may engage in, um, also by our definition, and I believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on the legal end, I think by the definition of the legal, it, does that not in, also engage them in, as a trafficking victim? Yeah, I thought so. It's because something of value has been exchanged. It changes the way law enforcement can look at a mother who exchanges her daughter for drugs. That's been happening for years. That can now be considered trafficking. So the trafficking laws actually give law enforcement another tool in their toolbox for arresting because the way it's defined now is broad enough to include some of the things that have been going on for a while, but they now have uh, another way of, uh, it just adds another charge uh, to it. So, um, in the whole United States, um, if you look at the scope of it, there are 1.6 million children that run away. That means they are ex exceptionally at risk for this particular issue. If we're looking at what are the vulnerabilities that these kids present with that put them at risk, running away is the, um, probably the top uh, reason. And this second one is kind of an apocryphal, um, I've never been able to find the source, but everybody speaks about that if they're uh, on the street for more than 48 hours, one in three will be, um, become victims of CSEC within that time frame. I think it's uh, sort of something that people figure, well, if they're out there for two days and they haven't eaten and it's getting cold, they're going to have to get in and then they become very vulnerable to be, being taken up. The average entry into commercial sex uh, is 12 to 14. So many of the, I, I've seen stats that like 68 to 70 percent of adult prostitutes came into the life when they were a minor. Uh, so to me that makes a different uh, sort of spin on whether they're actually doing it by choice even as an adult when you start looking at the whole history of what's gotten them there. All right, um, then this is kind of the slide that I use. Um, to just sort of show the, de the demand side and the supply side. And this is usually, the supply side is usually where everybody starts because it's the victims that grab our hearts. You know, it's so wrong, it's so bad uh, that we want to help them and rescue them and try to restore whatever normalcy you can restore uh, to them. So that's exactly where we started. But at some point, you also then start looking at the other side. But when we started out, our principal funder said, well, you know, how many? How many are out there? And we gave the sort of usual squishy nonprofit um, numbers of, well, we have this many runaways, and if we have this many runaways, you know, the chances are we have this many victims. Well, he basically said, as a businessman, he said, you know, that's not going to cut it. He said, if we don't know how many are out there, how are we going to ever know if we've made um, any, any uh progress. So we commissioned some research back in August of 2007. These are Georgia numbers, so you, the numbers, the absolute part of the numbers is not important. What's important is what they show. This is when we started the research, and there, I don't have enough time to go into the methodology, but we were measuring on the street, over the internet, through escort services, and in major hotels. So these, and then this is the, the total. So there was 251 girls a month that were being prostituted through those four portals in a month. For us in Georgia, that meant more girls harmed by prostitution in one month than were killed in car accidents in an entire year. 
once we had those figures, going to our legislature was like, I mean, they listened, you know, when we had uh, answers as to how many. And then we repeated that same methodology every quarter. What you can see, and this is what's important to notice, these three numbers, which are, this is the hotels, uh, this one's street, and this is escort services, this is the internet. These three num lines stay relatively flat over the, uh, we're up to May of 11. Over that whole time, those are relatively flat numbers, but look at what's happening to the internet number. It was going out of sight to where we started at 250 in 07 to where we were up slightly under 500, doubling the number of victims in one month in um, just a little over two years. We trended out those numbers at that point and it said at that rate we were going to have slightly under 1,500 victims a month at the rate that that was going. And all of the increase was happening because of what was happening over the internet. We, have, we then began to see some decline. Some of that was due to Craigslist shutting down. Um, but if you notice, and the, the one that doesn't show up here that happened over here, which I, I don't have the slide yet, is up again. So we're back on another upward trend. So unfortunately, um, that's been pretty much the case any place that's actually replicated the methodology. The, the, inter the internet is changing this business the way it changed every other business. So it becomes something that we really have to do something about and do it quickly. That was going to be the video. Yeah. Um, and that, what I want to talk about is on the supply side, what is it in particular that makes uh, the vulnerabilities that those can, um, ends up with them being exploited. And for the most part, what you're talking about is uh, a couple of, um, you have a history of child abuse or f sexual abuse in some way, shape, or form. Not in 100% of the cases, but in a lot. So that from the very beginning, these kids are on this continuum of abuse. Um, we have a survivor uh, that works with us, and she was being abused in her home from the age of six on. So by the time they get to 12 or 13, if you think about how you felt at 12 or 13, you probably, like all of us, figured, you know, we really didn't need our parents anymore. You know, we were doing pretty well, and so that's pretty much what they think, and they go out on the street. And unfortunately, don't realize how vulnerable they are at that point. But in the meantime, what that has done is the, the childhood sexual abuse makes it so they don't have a, a good sense of who are the people to trust. They've had boundaries violated. They have all kinds of psychological issues. So they have a, a, a difficult time finding uh, normal. And then all of the things that happen ending up with the commercial sexual exploitation. And we have certain red flags that we look at um, that are important to pay attention to. And this is, these are the ones that we look at within the juvenile justice system. The three that are the most important are the running away, particularly if they've run away multiple times. The truancy, because if they're running away a lot, they're probably not getting to school. That's one of the places somebody's been asking what the schools, what people can do in the community. Just kind of be tracking excessive truancy within your schools and start asking questions underneath that excessive truancy. And the history of the, this defects is our child protective services. So a history of involvement with your child protective services, truancy and running away are your three major red flags. So if you have somebody coming through the juvenile court with that, those three, his, those three um, red flags, then, then those are the girls that are now referred to our Voices Project and we look to see whether if they haven't been commercially sexually exploited, we keep them in our Voices Project. If they have been commercially sexually exploited, we move them over into the Georgia Care Connection, which is our statewide system of care for the girls that have been abused. They'll also have some of these other signs, possibly as part of their um, juvenile justice um, sort of history. So it's like getting probation officers and so on aware of what the red flags are so that uh, they can pay attention to what they have on their caseload. Um, so if we go back now to that, now I want to switch over to the demand side. And on the demand side, I want to say, I think we've, we've all of us paid attention to the facilitators, the pimps, the traffickers. And they're sort of, they, they, just as the victims get our compassion and our, our caring and grab our hearts, the facilitators just get, get our, our disgust. You know, how could anybody be so awful as to do that? But you know who we've historically given a free ride to? This one. 
we don't, we have sort of a cultural acceptance that it's okay to buy sex. Um, and that it's okay, not really that it's okay to buy sex with an underage person, but we, the same way we ran the research on the supply side, uh, if I went back to that slide, in August of 09, the Governor's Office for Children and Families took over paying for that research, which we'd been paying for quarterly. So that freed up some research dollars, and so then we thought, well, okay, if we've quantified the scope of the supply side, what can we do to quantify the scope of the demand side? So our researchers be, uh, posed as a fake escort service on Craigslist, Backpage, and about two or three others, and fielded calls. Because remember, they'd been posing as a potential buyer to escort services for two years. And they knew the kinds of questions that the escort service operators asked. So they w then became this fake escort service. And to me, the results of that research changed the conversation completely. What that showed us is that we had 7,200 men a month in Georgia that were knowingly or unknowingly buying sex from an adolescent girl. And that was staggering, staggering. That's not the pimps, that's the buyers. Those are the ones. And I have heard some of those tapes and they turn your stomach. It's like they're ordering up a pizza. Do they want African American? Do they want Asian? Do they want white? Do they, what old? How young do you have them? Um, so it was just, it, it was enough to make me ill. And the researchers, after they'd taken the first few calls, thought they'd, they'd think, well, if they actually knew, they were playing a fancy dance around age, and so they said, okay, well, if they actually knew it was going to be an underage escort was, that was going to be delivered, would they bow out? Would they say, no, I'm not interested? So they embedded a series of three warnings in the study. Each one was a little bit more explicit as to what was going to, the first one was like, well, she says she's 18, but I'm not so sure, to the last one that says there's no way that this girl is 18. So if they went through all three of the warnings, they knew that the, the uh, girl that was going to be delivered was underage. And uh, 40, I'll come back to this 42%. 47% went all the way through the three warnings. They didn't care. So what that means is that's, that's a, an issue where we have to get more uh, arrests and more prosecutions because they had no, um, no fear that they were going to get caught from doing this. It was just so, so obvious in the calls. Um, the 53%, that's if you're a glass half full person, that's the one you look at too. And those are different strategies. This is a law enforcement strategy to start, start to try and get more arrests. This one's an education. That says if we do more education, some, a, a, little, a slight over half is going to drop off. If we want to decrease demand, then we can, we can look at this as a way to, to decrease demand. This 42% come from North Metro outside the perimeter. That's what OTP means. Now, you're not from Atlanta. You're a long way from Atlanta. But what that means demographically, North Metro outside the perimeter, is primarily white, suburban, upper middle and middle class. So it was like, okay, all the people that were saying this was an inner city problem had to kind of uh, do a double take. It also means if we're really serious about going after the buyers, we need to be ready. We're gonna have our feet held to the fire because the people that are gonna get caught in those nets are our husbands, our fathers, our brothers, our uncles, our pastors, our doctors, our lawyers, our judges. There are going to be a lot of people in there that are going to be a little bit upset that they've gotten caught. And then it will, will have to come to uh, a, a realization of do we really want this to stop or, or have we just been pretending? So I think we're going to come to a point in this issue where we're, we are all going to have to look at, and it will really test all of our resolve as to how seriously we want to take this issue, or whether we want to just say we're just going to sacrifice a certain number of our teens from now until the end of the time um, because they're going to be there. As you can tell, I'm a little bit passionate about this part um, because I do believe we have to. We have a case in Georgia right now where it's a 55-year-old CEO of a private security firm who was caught with a 12-year-old in one of those North Metro counties. The pimp is being taken federally. He is being taken to court on the state. We plan to stack the courtroom with people for that trial because it is important to us um, that 
this person not be given, he is a fine, upstanding citizen in so many ways. And I do feel sorry for his family and his kids. And yet we can't, we have to be showing that this law is for everyone. Um, so when you're looking at in, in Iowa as to how you want to get started and how you want to go, there is a place for everybody at the table. On the demand side, what we're doing, legislation, you have, you have a better human trafficking law than we do uh, because you don't have forced fraud or coercion for anyone under 18. For us, it's only under 16. The 16 and 17 year olds, man, you gotta show that they were forced. Um, but we'll get that one changed sometime around. But um, you need law enforcement training so that the police recognize this for what it is and the prosecutors and the judges uh, see it for what it is. Um, Backpage, uh, we're, there's almost a national movement now to try and get Backpage to stop doing their um, ads. After Backpage goes down, not notice I don't say if, I say when, um, there'll be another one that we'll step to, into because it is a business and somebody else is gonna step up, but then we just go after that one. We just keep doing it wherever it's showing up. These were some billboards that we put up around Atlanta. Uh, it was a billboard, um, 86 year old man who made his money in billboard op uh, um, operations and he, he was the one that came up with that particular billboard. I, I had one that I, I gave him that I thought was great. He took one look at it and he said, ah, too many words. Um, and so he wrote that one and he said, sex, that'll get their attention. And then for the buyers and the pimps, and then it says five years to life because in Georgia you can get life if it's, uh, it's up uh, to life if it's an under 16. Supply side, uh, again, legislation, you do need services for your victims. Um, uh, we have a hotel project, and I mentioned this, I've talked to a couple of, here, of, of you here that are here as part of a church. Uh, one of our strongest partners in Georgia is uh, an organization called Street Grace, and they are looking to replicate their model. If you go to www.streetgrace.org, they have a toolkit that I think is gonna be coming out, and it, the, the churches have all banded together, and they are, a tremendous ally and the Georgia Baptist women's ministry we trained all of them and they're going around to all the hotels and the motels in Georgia and training all of their um, personnel on what to recognize and we were afraid if we said child sex trafficking that none of them would want to do it so they came up with the child safe zone that the hotels could want to be part of a child safe zone uh, and so they have decals that they'll give them so there are lots of ways that you can engage all the parts of your communities, because it will take everyone um, on this. Uh, and I think that's the end, other than, yeah. So Roxanne is gonna tell you a bit more what's happening in Iowa. Well, I'm an Iowa State economics grad, so the uh, supply and demand issues, I think, are very important ones. Uh, some of the research also has uh, indicated that um, if, you, if you use uh, what's called a John school, where you send the people who've been arrested who are not in it for profit, uh, if you send them to a school and talk to them about the impact uh, that it has on uh, the, the uh, prostitutes that they are uh, going to visit, it does have a huge impact because they haven't really thought about the long-term implications of what it is that they're doing. So that's another good program that has proven to be successful. Um, when, when we talk about, you have great statistics from Georgia, they're way ahead of us. Um, and of course, I'm, I'm a little picky about numbers uh, and, and how you measure things and making sure that you're measuring the right things. We have no idea. In, in Iowa. We, we just simply don't have numbers. We have not done any kind of systematic study when it comes to numbers. So what I'm going to do today instead is to talk a little bit about specific cases that we've had. So when people tell you that we don't have sex trafficking in Iowa, it is not true. Um, and we have prosecuted cases, you can see, all over the state. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about uh, some of these cases. This is one that Kevin talked about today, uh, Salas and Bowie. Um, this was in Johnson and Lynn County primarily, but it included other states as well. Uh, the victims were 15 years old and 16 years old. 
Um, we had state charges against uh, these two individuals, and you'll notice that the state charges also included the crime of ongoing criminal conduct. That is our organized financial crime statute in Iowa because people are doing this for profit. And we need to recognize that they are doing this to make money. So when the people are making money, we need to also charge them with the crime of making money doing things that are bad. Uh, so the, it, it's helpful to have that, um, to, to be able to charge that crime. And of course, at this point, when this crime was happening, we didn't have human trafficking as an option. Uh, but ongoing criminal conduct is also a really good one, and it's a 25-year sentence. Um, and then Mr. Bowie uh, was actually charged. He's the one who actually uh, took the 13-year-old from, uh, from Minneapolis to Iowa. So he was charged federally uh, with kidnapping and was sentenced to 35 years. Um, just to give you a sense of what this, this case was about, um, and, and all of this is information that came from the media, um, so this is not the law enforcement sensitive part of, of the uh, investigation. Salas was the mastermind. Uh, they had an online website called uh, Naughty by Nature. Uh, it's a prostitution business that he ran uh, in Cosgrove, Iowa, which is a pretty small town in uh, Johnson County. Um, and then later from Williamsburg uh, and uh, the prosecutor said that Salas coerced two girlfriends into managing his prostitution enterprise. Um, and Kevin gave you some sense of how he managed that, that business. Um, it was an unpleasant experience for everybody who was involved um, and enlisted his sons to help out. So this was a family business that they were running. Um, Salas was arrested as part of a larger state and federal investigation. His son, uh, DeMont Bowie, was also, uh, at that time, even then, a convicted sex offender. Um, and uh, he's the one who kidnapped the 13-year-old from Minneapolis and brought her to Iowa um, on Easter. He employed her in prostitution in Northeast Iowa for three weeks, and, um, and then um, Salas's girlfriend sent her back to Minneapolis when she figured out that she was 13, because apparently she looked 18. No, she was actually 13. Uh, but the description that was given, this, was, this is from the Cedar Rapids Gazette stories. Uh, There's a whole series of stories written about this case. Uh, and they described the experience of this 13-year-old uh, girl. Uh, she was given a choice. She could either have sex with two men nearly twice her age, or she would be given back to Mr. Bowie, who had already beaten her. Um, and already, um, she, he had beaten and abused her, starved her, deprived her of sleep, um, traded her body to his friends and even a mechanic, uh, and when he told her to do something, she did. Uh, this is someone who is really not going to be able to come forward. She's not going to have the opportunity to, to tell people what it is that's happening. It gives you a good sense of, of what the common techniques are that are being used by these traffickers because uh, he certainly is a dangerous person, and, and she knew that. Uh, she'd survived a week. Um, DeMont was gone. He ran away after a, he had a fight with his father. Um, and then there's a, a description of her uh, when she was terrified and, and was forced to have sex again with another adult male and an underage boy. Um, and. Uh, you'll notice getting her out of the business, it seemed to produce poison in so many ways, would almost cost one Iowa woman her life. So it's a, it's a dangerous business and, of course, highly profitable. Uh, this is, I, I actually took this off the internet last week. Uh, this is uh, Mr. Bowie's MySpace page. So it's still up. Uh, the other case, this is the one that Denise talked about this morning, uh, Leonard Russell and Marsha Ryan. Uh, Crawford County case, the arrest was in 2008, the victims were 15 and 16. Um, human trafficking, ongoing criminal conduct and pandering. Um, and in this case, uh, these were the two girls that were running away from a juvenile facility in Nebraska. Um, and uh, Marsha Ryan, uh, one of the co-defendants, introduced herself as Jazzy. 
uh, and she's the one who invited them into her hotel room, and they smoked some marijuana, and, and then the really bad stuff began to happen. Um, they were told that they would have to make their own money as they traveled around, so they had opportunities for travel. Uh, and I think did not have any idea what kinds of things were going to go along with that. Um, and then we're told that, that part of the expectation was that they were going to be working at strip clubs um, and as prostitutes, which is exactly what happened with these two girls. Um, he, Mr. Russell's name was Sir. Everybody that worked for him called him Sir. Uh, that was one of his aliases. Um, and. As we mentioned this morning, uh, very common for people to use aliases. It makes it much more difficult for, for the investigators to be able to track down who's involved, what kinds of things they're doing. Uh, it, it makes the investigation much more difficult if we don't have the same name or if we don't have the real name that's being used as part of that investigation. So they went to Davenport in Rock Island, back to Denison, um, engaging in prostitution and performing at strip clubs, and it was the tip that, uh, that led the police to find uh, the first victim, and that led us to the second victim as well. So when, when you see something like that happen, it really is important. Um, both girls said they didn't like what they were doing, they felt ashamed, but they really had no options. And that's something that you hear regularly from the, the victims of, of trafficking, that they just don't know what the other options are. Uh, all of their money uh, went to uh, Sir and Jazzy in exchange for food, uh, and ultimately they were recovered. Another case in 2009 in Decorah. Uh, this is uh, a Winnesheik County case. The victim was 17, year, 17 years old. We had both physical and sexual assault in this case. Um, he was charged under state law with human trafficking and sexual abuse second and some drug offenses. Uh, this is the picture of the house where this occurred. And you can't really see it in this picture, um, but it is remote. So it's out in the middle of nowhere. Um, very difficult for anybody to know what was going on. Uh, and in fact, kind of behind that house is just one of the bluffs in, in Winnesheet County. Uh, you really can't see what's going on back in that house. Um, so uh, it, it's a very isolated kind of an experience. Um, so obviously very, very common. Uh, this is the news report. It said that the uh, charges stem from an investigation after they got a 911 call from a 17-year-old girl who was being held against her will. Um, as their investigation continued, they learned that she'd been physically and sexually assaulted. Uh, the police um, immediately began asking the right kinds of questions. They did a complete investigation and, and they were able to prove up the case uh, remarkably well uh, for a kid that was, that was really very, very isolated and, and beaten very badly. Uh, so he got 25 years for second degree sexual abuse, 25 years for human trafficking, and five years on the, uh, the drug charges as well, because he was also supplying drugs to the victim. That makes it harder for them to remember, so much harder to investigate. Another case, an Iowa case uh, from Fredericksburg, Brandon Hagen, uh, he's an over the road, he was an over the road trucker at the time, charged in 2009. Uh, with a 13-year-old victim, sexual assault, assault charges, and he was charged federally uh, because he drove the victim from Iowa to Missouri, actually a couple of different times, um, and sexually assaulted her in Iowa as well. Um, but he, uh, he, was, he had a relationship with the victim's mother and uh, persuaded her to go along with him when he was traveling as part of his job as a truck driver. So there were two occasions when they went to uh, Kansas and, and she rode along with him and he sexually assaulted her repeatedly on the way there and on the way back uh, on both of those trips. Uh, she really didn't have any choice about whether she was gonna go. Uh, and this was, a, this was not really a for-profit uh, example of sex trafficking. This was just a, a family relationship uh, that also involved trafficking of, of the child. Um, 
I also picked this one up last week on the internet, um, Brandon's uh, Facebook or MySpace page, um, and uh, some nice pictures of him uh, and uh, who he's interested in meeting. So he's still he still has an active MySpace page. He's in prison. Um, here's another one. Um, this one is the uh, the Council Bluffs and Omaha case. There are four defendants in this case, uh, and this truly was an organized criminal gang uh, that was operating. Uh, they ended up pleading guilty to conspiracy to commit or financially benefit from sex trafficking. Um, operated in the Omaha Council Bluffs area. The victims uh, in this case were 13 and 15 years old, both physical and sexual abuse, and we had the federal charges that resulted in sentences of uh, between 14 and 17 years for the four people who were involved. Um, the way that it worked, uh, as, as was described by the victims and the other witnesses, um, the, the mastermind was Meredith Crane Horton, uh, she was the one who really ran the business, and Edwin, her husband, was the accountant. He was the one who handled all of the money. This was a very lucrative business for them. Uh, and they worked with Ramon and Catherine Heredia. Um, Ramon was the muscle for the group, and uh, Catherine prostituted herself to, uh, to make expenses if they were not making enough money uh, doing other things. It also made it easier for her to be able to persuade people to uh, cooperate with the, with the organization. So uh, this is another example of uh, somebody who was having some trouble, the victim was having some trouble at home. Uh, she ran away um, and she was under supervision, under juvenile court supervision, uh, but still managed to get away. Um, and she had known Ramon before. Um, so they offered her a place to stay, and uh, once she got there, she could not leave. Uh, she simply was not allowed to leave at all. Uh, and she was warned that if she said anything, the police would be called and she would be in trouble. So there was no reason for her to call and ask for help uh, because she would still be in trouble. Um, she, was, she was forced to be a, a prostitute. All of the money, of course, went to the, to the uh, criminal group. Uh, and she finally was able to escape with a, another 13-year-old who was also a victim in this case. They stole a car and uh, were able to go and get help. Um, and uh, they were regularly physically abused and sexually abused as, as part of this organization. So here's another, uh, the, the, and this is all news accounts of, of what it was that was happening. Um, they worked on the streets for several months, so they were not just confined to the house. Um, a couple of the victims also uh, worked the streets. Uh, sometimes they would get gifts. Um, sometimes they would get threats. Sometimes they'd get beatings. Um, and it was hard for them to know exactly what to expect. Um, so finally, there was one night that, uh, that one of the victims who had maintained a relationship with her mother was really afraid and she was able to get away at a convenience store and call her mother and tell her that she needed help. Um, so the mother then of course contacted the police and, and they were able to find uh, the child at that point. Um, but. It was still, the mother, the mother talked to the media and said it was still a struggle. She was very tied to this group. She still had, uh, she still cared about um, Ramon in particular. Um, and, and the mother said it's very difficult to tear someone away from that kind of uh, commitment that they were forced to have uh, in that kind of relationship. Um, but. They, they also had another kid that replaced her shortly after that. Um, and she only worked for a few weeks for the ring and then uh, the arrests began shortly after that. So it takes a while for the investigation to be able to be put together to actually be able to make the arrests. So it cannot be immediate. Uh, so these are just some of the quotes from, from the victims. 
Uh, and you can tell what the impact is. It's going to have a very long time impact. Uh, and this is fairly typical of what you see with uh, the people who have survived this kind of an experience. Uh, that uh, they, it, it affects their sleep. They, they have very difficult times with uh, experiences with relationships. Um, and uh, one of them, the, the uh, second victim, said that the state took custody of her daughter and she's working hard to try and regain custody at this point. So uh, certainly has huge impacts on the victims. Um, also, when we talk about demand, the, the uh, outgrowth of this particular uh, group was that we also had two arrests um, that of people who were using the services of the victims in this case. Uh, one owns the Speedway near Greenwood, Nebraska. He's a fairly well-known person over in the Omaha area. And um, used the screen name Tim Taylor. He was a pretty regular customer. Um, paid them around $3,000 and there were indications that he also had paid the rent on the house where they lived in Omaha. Uh, so he was a, he was a regular uh, frequent customer. The same is true for the other uh, the other defendant, John Haas, um, recruited the 15-year-old and uh, after, after Crane, uh, the mastermind, recruited the 15 and 13-year-old, uh, asked Haas to break them in because he was also a regular customer of this particular criminal organization. Um, so um, that, that's exactly what he did. And it, it certainly appeared that that was what he did on a pretty regular basis. The other one that I wanted to mention, this one was actually prosecuted in South Dakota, but it does have some Iowa connections because the doctor was actually arrested when he was working for an emergency room in Iowa. Um, Dr. Uh, Joshua Payer uh, was, um, he worked part-time in Iowa, part-time in South Dakota. He also had a practice uh, part-time in Minnesota. And he was arrested in 2010 when, when he was in Spencer. Uh, the victims in this case were underage teenagers, a whole variety of underage teenagers. Um, and the defendants were charged with sex trafficking and distribution of controlled substances. They ran a prostitution ring in T, South Dakota. And there's a reason you've probably never heard of it. It's a very small town in South Dakota. Um, this, is, this is a medical doctor. And the victim said, I told him this is something I didn't want to do. He didn't feel sorry at all. He made me do things I didn't want to. And then he admitted that he knew that they were being held against their will and did nothing to stop it. So when we talk about demand, we're talking about any, any group of people, uh, including professionals, who may very well promote that kind of business. Um, he was described as a frequent customer. He, we did uh, have his medical license suspended, and he eventually hopes to get it back. Um, he was suspended uh, pretty quickly uh, in Minnesota, Iowa, and South Dakota on a temporary basis. Um, Iowa did bring disciplinary charges, uh, but then he voluntarily surrendered his license in both South Dakota and in Iowa. Uh, when you have a voluntary surrender, it's easier to get the license back. So he has not been revoked in either South Dakota or Iowa, um, but um, he did have his license revoked in Minnesota. Uh, they would not accept a voluntary surrender in Minnesota. Um, the statements from the victim about the ringleader of this particular group, um, one of the victims said, I, I had to live in fear for two or three months. I feel manipulated. I was promised the world and got nothing. Um, and uh, and many of them said he gave the victims life sentences. So that's what they think the ringleader should have gotten as well. Um, a little bit more about the ringleader, uh, Brandon Thompson. Um, and the judge in this case was particularly affected uh, by some of the statements that, uh, that Mr. Thompson had to, had to make. Um, and the judge said, I could give you 30 years, but instead, I'm going to give you life. So, 
Um, and and it, I, don't, I don't think that there were any indications of just how many victims there were in this case, but it was, it was a substantial number of victims. This has been operating for a long time. So you can see in Iowa, we do have a whole variety of different sex trafficking cases that have been prosecuted. There are so many more that are not reported. Um, and, uh, and, and I'm very glad that we're doing this kind of a conference to try and encourage people to make those kinds of reports, provide the information that we need, uh, and make some efforts to, to try and stop this if we can. Thank you. Okay, uh, now is the opportunity for you to ask questions, and we have about 15 minutes left of the session, and we welcome your questions. Yes, sir. I was concerned about the MySpace postings. I understand the Department of Corrections has rules against such postings. Are these put up or maintained by surrogates? Or yes. Are they still active? Yeah. Okay. Do they still profit from them? Do they still profit from them? Do they help a business or anything? Um, well, not from the MySpace pages. Those are those are just personal pages that they're. So th those pages are are actually not related to the business. Those are just their their personal websites. And there there are restrictions as well for people who are in prison. Kathy, I just wondered where you talked about forty seven percent. Kit went ahead even after they had three warnings, 53% dropped off. Do you think education of those individuals would help uh, educate them on the, all the uh, circumstances way before this time? Yes, um, that is our hope. That We think that 53%, if we can begin to get more word out about it, that they, that they will drop off um, of their own. The only thing correlated with dropping off with the, was age. The older men on that tended to be the one that more, that more dropped off. Um, so that was interesting. We thought they probably were more likely to have a daughter that was in that age. But most of the empirical research indicates that people who are generally pro-social are, are more susceptible to education uh, to reduce demand. If you have people who are generally anti-social, education doesn't really help. Uh, but for people who are you know, regular members of society and, and generally have pro-social lives, it's, it certainly is much more effective to be able to do that. They just haven't thought through the consequences of what they're doing. Um, this is a bit sensitive, but um, I was wondering how much attention is paid to younger victims, um, small children and even babies, because we know that that happens. I just feel like people really, that's something that people really, really don't want to look at or talk about because it's so awful and horrible. Um, but I do believe that that happens in Iowa as well. It certainly does, and, and I know we, I, I personally have handled a lot of those cases, uh, and we see a, a frightening number of those cases as well. Uh, the, the one thing about uh, having smaller children is that they tend to see medical professionals fairly regularly, uh, and the medical professionals have been very good about recognizing abuse, and, and of course we have mandatory reporter laws that, uh, that the health profession has been very, very good about that. The same is true once they get to school age, that, that the mandatory reporters in the schools are also very helpful. Um, those, those kinds of charges in Iowa are 25 year sentences, uh, 25 to life, uh, and, and they certainly are treated very, very seriously. Um, and they're forcible felonies, which mean that they have to go to prison. There is absolutely no option for probation. Uh, the difficulty that we have with those cases is similar to what we see with human trafficking, though, is that you still have to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, and, uh, and if there are injuries, um, you know, then you can have some medical testimony about it. Uh, for kids who are pre-verbal, all you have is physical evidence. Um, and even for the kids who are under six or seven, uh, it's very difficult to get reliable testimony from the kids. I mean, they just, they're not, um, uh, they're difficult witnesses. 
You showed the uh, graph with the spike uh, with uh, you know, the internet and, and then it dropped with uh, the termination of Craigslist. And could you talk, and earlier there was a, a, a victim uh, or, or a survivor rather who talked about uh, her personal story and that she was listed on Craigslist. What did it take to get Craigslist to, to get out of this uh, business and who has taken their place and what do you see as the role of uh, similar sites uh, in the future? That's a, that's a really good question and, and on that same graph I didn't have time. There were a couple of dips. Um, it just so happened that we were doing the research right when a couple of things happened. Craigslist initially uh, didn't charge any money for that and then they charged and said you had to have a unique verifiable phone number in order to place one of the ads in the adult sex industry. That very next time there was a considerable drop but by the next time we went, the, the, the numbers were back up and over the internet had sp sprung up all these businesses that were selling unique verifiable phone numbers in blocks of a thousand. So within the course of three months another industry had been spawned by that. Um, <clears throat> so. Um, what happened, what brought down Craigslist was a lot of people across the country really um, uh, working on uh, pressuring. CNN did a number of uh, stories on it and uh, they just got to be very hot in the court of public opinion. In fact, Craigslist thought that we had done our demand research trying to bring them down where the reality was we put the escort service ads on a bunch of um, sites and Craigslist got three times as many hits on the site th there as anybody else. So we hadn't done it to bring down Craigslist, but they were clearly the, the market leader um, in terms of that. So right now, Backpage it was the predominant winner when Craigslist shut down. They still are prostituted over Craigslist. They don't charge for the ads and they're kind of embedded in it, but police will still say there are kids, right? I can see you shaking your head back there. Craigslist is not out of the business yet. They're just not quite wanting to be quite as upfront about what they're doing with it. Backpage is proving to be much more difficult to bring down. It's owned by Village Voice Media, which is a fairly reputable um, company um, that began in the 1950s with Norman Mailer. Um, the only profitable part of um, Village Voice Media is Backpage. So if Backpage goes down, probably Village Voice Media will go down. So they are fighting tooth and nail. There was a young girl, 14, who um, sued Backpage uh, because she had been advertised and exploited over Backpage and she lost the suit uh, with a very compassionate, um, oh, whatever you call it from the judge, statement by, by the judge um, because the Communications Decency Act uh, does not make it to where they can be. They're only, it would be like if I called you up and ordered drugs and then you tried to sue AT&T for providing the phone line that I called you on. Uh, and that's the way they're able to, uh, I'm still not totally sure there isn't a way around it, but right now it's just a lot. Of, uh, 51, I think, attorneys general, Iowa was being one of them, just recently sent a letter to Backpage. A bunch of clergy just sent a letter, took an ad out in the New York Times. We're starting to do a whole bunch of things. There's a, um, a petition online right now, I think, with Groundswell. If you go through change.org, you'd probably find it. They're just trying to get court of public opinion turning against Backpage. But it's going to be a long struggle with them. And, and I've heard they... Uh, Ernie Allen with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children and our principal funder met with, Larkin is his name, I think he's the CEO, and he was just really, he just about came across the table to Ernie Allen, you know, I mean, he's a, kind of a thuggish kind of a guy, so it's, that one's going to be a real fight to get them to take it down, but I believe it's getting lots of people knowing that that's what's happening all across the country and bringing the court of public opinion to bear on them. So in whatever ways you can, just start adding your voice to that. Did you want to add anything? Well, the only thing I would add is that once again, if, if you address demand, that's going to take care of the business issues. If we can reduce the demand, these businesses are simply not going to thrive. What kind of mandatory reporting or what kind of training is report, 
required for mandatory reporters? How it's, it's, there, are, there are both statutes and administrative rules that require the reporting and they're fairly standard programs that are used. I, I just recently retired from schools and my recollection is for child abuse, it's once every five years. Mm -hmm. And after being here, that seems pretty, we have bloodborne pathogens every year. <laughs> which, which seems far less <laughs> innocuous. <laughs> I would say in Georgia, um, uh, what we did was start to really go through and then train the child abuse people so that they're including that in their trainings, plus going around and training medical personnel, all of the mandatory reporters, so that they knew the more particular signs for this particular kind of child abuse. Right, and, and the schools. You have to go in and individually to begin with, even though it is child abuse, you actually have to train the child abuse people because they don't necessarily have it on their radar screen either. Mm -hmm. My question is for the, the first speaker. And um, I thought I heard you say that um, your services of your program are, um, the programs you have for the victims are for only US citizens. And I don't know if that, was correct, but I just really wanted to just ask about that and see what happens if you're not a U.S. citizen. Actually, if you're a non-U.S. citizen, you have a lot more options available to yourself because you'll come under the TVPRA, and there are there are actually more services available. The only re we would we would treat um, non-U.S. citizens if they could speak English. Our, the programs that exist for for victims are all run in English. There are some. Um, immigrant and refugee communities, um, organizations within the community that actually work with the, uh, with those that are the foreign born victims. So there are, but, but under the TVPRA there are actually a fair number of services that are available um, through the government for them. Um, as far as the, uh, the other side, the demand side, um, I, uh, I'm actually a published author of uh, a sex addiction book and been through abuse in a lot of the, what the girls see. Um, as far as the uh, training of John, uh, the, the people that are buying these girls, uh, what, what kind of stuff are we actually looking at there? Because I know it's still fairly new. Um. It, it would depend. The John schools are, are specifically for men who have bought adult prostitutes. If a man is uh, uh, found with an underage, and in Georgia, a lack of knowledge of the age is, no, is not a defense. I don't know whether that's the case. That's true here, that's too. That's true here, too. Okay. So they would not be given a John school as a diversion. They would, they would be going to, to jail. Um, in terms of um, um, if you're talking any kind of sexual addiction, um, kinds of issues, that would be something that would probably be addressed through the court. But again, if it's a child, it won't matter. You, you're going to have to get the 12 step in prison. <laughs> and if it's a child, it's, it's very likely that you're going to be going to prison. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if you're convicted of human trafficking, you are going to prison. Uh, for ongoing criminal conduct, prison is not required. but. Uh, but in the human trafficking cases that we've had, they've gone to prison. And if, you're, if you are a sex offender in Iowa, you are required to go through sex offender treatment before you are released. Uh, and, and you cannot be released until you've discharged your sentence if you have not completed the sex offender treatment program. And we also have a sexually violent predator program in Iowa so that if you are a, uh, if you qualify as a sexually violent predator, you can be civilly committed until it is safe to release you. And so far, I don't think we've released anybody from our sexually violent predator program. Um, before we go today, I'd just like to ask you what your recommendations are for reducing demand for trafficked children and youth. Arrest. <laughs> I know that sounds funny, but um, I think we as a society have to stop. I, I'm talking about the buyer. Um, there has to be um, 
Mothers Against Drunk Driving were successful in changing the climate about how we looked at drunk dri dr driving and, and uh, drinking and driving, uh, where when I grew up, you know, my parents were the only ones that were saying not to do that. Now the kids know to get a designated driver. That it's, it, they've changed the culture around that, and it came from a grassroots. So I do think that we have to start working at the grassroots level to start, we have to start giving our young boys different messages around what it takes to be a man. And this is not a gender issue, even though the, the girls are the ones that are being bought. This is, this is as much what messages our young boys are getting as to what's okay behavior. Um, so I think I would say, for those that are doing it and I'm presently engaged in it, it's only going to be deterrence for that 47%. And we have to, as a culture, start saying we want those men arrested, even if it is the people that are um, the doctors and so on. For the younger, we need to start looking at how we're raising our young boys. I think especially if it's a professional or someone with status in the community, that sends a, a clearer message than just about anything else that this this is dangerous business for anybody and that we're going to treat everybody uh, as seriously as it should be treated. Uh, arrest and prosecution are absolutely essential, uh, but not nearly enough because the, the time, the expense, and the, the difficulties that uh, that come along with all of the due process requirements, which, you know, as a lawyer, I certainly think due process is important, um, but it goes far beyond that. Um, and, and really, we do have to change the, the culture and the expectations so that people recognize that it is a problem everywhere. We are not exempt from it, and, and those prevention efforts have to be implemented everywhere we look. Uh, in the juvenile court system, in the in the schools, in the religious communities, uh, everywhere, in our families. and in our families e everywhere. Talk to Roxanne. Talk <laughs> <laughs> Someone just had you just had your hand up here. Okay, if you. Uh, go ahead. Okay, it was actually more of a comment, I guess, but um, I was just thinking, like, you know they do the sexual education in middle school and in high school, they kind of re reiterate it and do the whole, like, D.A.R.E. program and against drugs and everything, and I think maybe if they start talking about the other outlets, they talk about, you know, safe sex, protect, like, protecting yourself from diseases, but they never really talk about, like, strip clubs or pornography or those other outlets and I don't know like I've, I haven't heard of any programs like that do you know of anything I don't know of anything although uh, I I am familiar with the research on the dare program and the dare program has been remarkably ineffective um, so uh, so I'm a little reluctant to to focus on those types of programs until we can identify what it is that would would truly be effective. And I think it may be some of the underlying problems. The other, the other concern is that one of, my, one of my favorite pieces of social science research says that if you've been victimized once, your chances of being victimized again are seven times higher. So if we are taking good care of our young kids, we are protecting them for, for a lifetime. So focusing on young people is also very, very, very important. Uh, avoiding that victimization makes an enormous difference in people's lives. <clears throat> well, ca oh, we're going oh. to say that Kathy going to the airport is not the only person who has an appointment. Roxanne is running the next part of the program downstairs right now. So we're going to have to bring it to a close here. But last round of applause for Roxanne and for Kathy.